Uh, so our final speaker for this session is Michael. Uh, gee, Michael, I've forgotten your last name. Great. Great. Uh, he's the senior manager of technology advisory forensic group at McGrath Nickel here in Melbourne. Uh, he advises clients on all matters technological. Michael has expertise in seizure and analysis of digital evidence, data recovery, electronic evidence, preservation, and conducting other computer-related fraud investigations. Before here, he was in New Zealand. He worked for the litigation management unit in Inland Revenue. Uh, before commencing this position at Minter Ellison. Uh, uh, really looking forward to this talk. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I uh, should add a caveat that I won't be quoting um, Hippocrates as well. So, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure that uh, my presentation is going to be uh, very sort of central to you, but it's uh, coming from a very different angle um, and a totally unrelated industry to your, you know, healthcare um, profession. And I love the emphasis on care mixing um, and all of the points that you raise about um, the thoughts of people committing, uh, you know, things to words. Um, to text about how they hate people and things like that, actually putting that in writing uh, is something that I deal with in my day-to-day -day role. <laughs> so simply put, I'm a forensic technology examiner and um, this is a silly question, but hands up, who has actually ever seen a, an episode of CSI? Right, a few people, so I am Abby. <laughs> Had a change of hair colour and a bit of a cut and not quite so gothic. Um, <laughs> uh, but effectively, I am Abby at a snail's pace because, as we know, that everything that is condensed down into a 45-minute or 50-minute TV episode might actually take weeks or months to actually undertake. Uh, and my areas of practice actually predominantly involve bribery and corruption investigations, fraud, misconduct, and that includes bullying, sexual harassment allegations, violations of codes of conduct, um, in short, sort of improper conduct or conduct unbecoming, um, and that's over a range of industries. And I know that you have someone speaking at the conference um, who's actually from the um, uh, construction industry as well, where they have very high regulations on um, occupational health and safety. And they actually hold um, their employees to very high levels of, um, of general codes of conduct as well. Um, and I think they have similar issues in, in terms of uh, allegations um, being made, uh, sometimes frivolously. Uh, and then we also deal with insider trading cases and also litigation and regulatory matters. So my involvement um, in the realm of the healthcare industry um, has actually been over the course of my um, professional career with various healthcare um, industry bodies over the past six years and have actually been involved as an expert witness on a couple of occasions as well. Uh, so some of the investigations have included allegations of misconduct, fraud and deception as well, um, which is probably not something that you um, might uh, initially think of as maybe a complaint um, from you know, your perspective as professionals, but there are many allegations of fraud and deception um, that actually come through to us. Uh, also private healthcare business matters as well, including even litigation and I think your comment about the administration uh, being um, you know, brought into that and that wall between healthcare professionals and administration, I probably actually see quite a few more um, legal matters uh, involving the business administration side of things as well. So it's always interesting to work on those. Uh, and I know that, you know, in terms of investigations, disputes in this area are often very protracted and the flow on effects of long investigations um, can involve a wide range of issues. So I wanted to talk to you today about my role as, an, as a forensic technology examiner and what tools and techniques we're actually using to speed up um, and shorten uh, drastically our investigation times uh, or um, actually use them for pre-analysis of, um, of complaints or investigations as well. Uh, because I think in the industry, not just healthcare, but in general corporate industry, there is a focus on actually uh, dismissing initial complaints if there is no basis for them. Um, so that early assessment uh, is people are very keen uh, to actually uh, decrease the burden of a lot of these investigations because um, we're becoming very litigious. I'm actually a Kiwi um, and you know I came over to Australia about six years ago and I went, whoa, what are your employment laws saying? 
um, they're very stringent uh, and I think less forgiving than the, uh, the New Zealand um, employment laws where we actually have, I think, more of an emphasis or have done in the past as well on coaching and having positive discussions uh, and actually uh, incorporating the human element. So it's not one strike you're out, um, you know, serious misconduct. There's actually a, a greater tendency uh, to actually either proving an allegation or actually coaching and counselling someone through. So that's my approach as a forensic technology investigator, um, and I hope that aligns with some of your um, your sort of thoughts on, on the subject. Hopefully I don't say anything too controversial to you. Um, so just a little bit about forensic technology. You've all watched CSI, you know, pretty much, the majority. Uh, we um, have certain guidelines about how we handle and uh, handle electronic evidence, uh, and one of the benefits that we bring to the table is we are actually independent. Um, and Maxine, to your point about you know having people who are in the industry investigating, I think there's also a case to be said for actually having independence as well, so that there is a removal of bias, um, and we are actually able to approach things from a very commercial sense. Uh, and actually leverage off um, dealing with other industries. We often find that you know, when lawyers fight lawyers, they act like lawyers. And uh, I had a, a matter recently where a lawyer was married to another lawyer. Um, they were divorcing and they all engaged lawyers. So it was really a lawyer fest <laughs> really, at the end of the day. And every dirty tactic that lawyers use was brought out in this personal marital dispute. And I just, you know, we got called in and and just thought, okay, let's try and remove uh, that element of it and bring a freshness to it and bring that independence to the table. So what do we do? We actually do digital forensics and incident response, large-scale large corporate investigations. So we're used to dealing with very large data sets and you know, the advent of uh, data analytics in the past few years has enabled us to cull and uh, actually find information a heck of a lot faster. It's also imposed a, a lot of burdens in my role. Uh, as well, uh, you know, huge amounts of data. For your information, I think it's uh, very important to understand where we may actually draw evidence from um, in these investigations. And I say this with the caveat that, uh, you know, I rely on electronic evidence. Uh, often I, you know, in my role, I have to interview people. Um, but everything that I uh, discuss with you today is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and that's something I'm very cautious counselling my clients on, that just because someone has written something in writing does not mean that there is not an underlying story that actually goes with it. Um, and that is incredibly important uh, because people can jump to conclusions after seeing words on a, on a page um, and it doesn't necessarily tell the whole truth. Um, and while I appreciate that there's uh, a need to shorten the length of your investigations, there is also a case uh, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter how long, uh, it, uh, how long it takes you to actually get to the truth. Um, because I think that is a really fundamental core belief of mine, uh, that it's very important not to jump to, jump to conclusions uh, and actually properly investigate things as well where it necessitates it. And I think that comes to uh, a risk factor as well. So we draw from uh, desktop computers, um, oh sorry, yeah, desktop computers, laptop computers, email servers, uh, email accounts as well, so online sources of, sources of evidence, mobile devices, be it tablets, I've seen people holding up tablets and photographing all of the, uh, the information on the slides today. We look at online data, WhatsApp, social media, Facebook, you know, all of these instant messaging applications, uh, the, the plethora of them that are being used today. Uh, but there are a couple of uncommon things that often, and it's rare in my role that I'm called to actually use them, uh, but photocopy and memory is a big one. Uh, usually once or twice a year we actually have to extract out what has been printed from a printer. Uh, PlayStation data, you might not think it, but um, there are certain circumstances where, uh, uh, and I can think of, um, this really comes to um, inappropriate conduct in the workplace and things like that and when people have actually been using gaming devices and, and things like that it, it is important and the police cover a lot of these sources of evidence as well so that's why it bleeds through to, to us in corporate uh, investigations. Car navigation systems as well, um, a cell and mobile tower data. I had an investigation recently where someone was trying to find out who had broken into the house and they were fortunately in Turak and uh, it was very easy for us to segregate out within an hour um, of sort of time window, 
the set registered cell phone numbers that were not registered to the Turak area. And that brings your suspect list down to about 25 people, especially when it's you know after 11.30 at night. And you have to be um, uh, thoughtful that the phone checks in with a cell tower. Every sort of you know 10 seconds or so, we get a ping on it. So someone driving through the area or walking through the area is not present in the area um, for a, a significant period of time, enough to have been counted as a suspect. So these things are real, and you know, in the course of criminal investigations, they are so material and so important. The other thing that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, these are the infrequent things, um, is recovery of deleted material. Uh, and I wonder um, if I you know, ask for a hands up on how many people think that it's possible to recover a deleted file off your computer. Yeah, okay, great. The easiest part of my job is to do that. Uh, and it's the place that we start first. Because what is human nature? It is to erase the incriminating evidence. So, you know, fortunately for us in some circumstances, uh, offenders will actually lead us to the evidence by the simple act of deletion. <laughs> Not very wise when you think about it in that context. Uh, then I think as well, um, how many for deleted emails? Yeah, only a couple. Yeah, yeah, a few. Very easy. Very easy for us. If we have access to the device, incredibly easy. Or it could be a server or it could be a backup. Um, you know, it doesn't, just because you're sending an email, does not mean that it's not flowing through a corporate email server uh, and then there's backups and multiple copies. People are slowly becoming aware of this, but I think for a, a large amount of time, they purely think that, oh sorry, uh, they think that uh, uh, just because they've deleted it off their device doesn't mean that it's actually not accessible. Deleted Facebook history, entirely possible to recover those inappropriate conversations that someone may have. Uh, and uh, I think from um, you know, the previous presentation, we talk about uh, you know, one thing, you know, one strike and you're out. Um, it's very important to consider, not just for healthcare professionals, but any professional, that this material is recoverable. Snapchat, uh, I lecture to fourth year accounting students on forensic uh, accounting. And you know, always hands up who thinks you can recover a deleted Snapchat and knowing, nah, no, it's only there for 30 seconds. <laughs> it's, all, it's all there, it's all there. Uh, so what else can we do though? So we've got recovery of all of this deleted material. We actually can look at event logs when something, someone has done something, every single USB device uh, that someone has ever plugged into a computer with serial numbers as well. Uh, cloud service activity. Uh, we work on a lot of cases where there's intellectual property theft. Uh, so even proving that someone has access Dropbox within work hours and being able to narrow it down to a you know, 40 or 50 minute time frame, um, it, it sometimes begs the question, uh, and this is where I you know, always counsel, don't jump to the conclusion. It maybe just is a question that needs to be asked. Recovered webmail, online search history, social media browsing history, mobile backup activity, recent document history. We see a lot. And within about 20, 10 to 15 minutes uh, of sitting down with a new piece of evidence, we will very quickly come to understand that user, their behaviours and their habits as well, and uh, their general course of activity. What I wanted to focus on in the next part of the presentation is actually interrogation of communication. Um, and how we analyse that communication and flow. Uh, this is an example of uh, what we actually get when we extract out someone's iPhone, and uh, you know it happens in about 20 minutes. Um, you can see there I've highlighted some. There's 112 or 113 passwords. There's recently searched items. There's 545 deleted chats uh, and 234 deleted SMS messages. Uh, we actually had a, a vexatious complaint come through from a um, it was a lecturer and a student. And the student uh, was alleging that the lecturer um, was talking inappropriately over, over an application called WeChat. Does anyone know what catfishing is? It's an online phenomenon where someone pretends to be someone else. Okay, uh, and I think Americans, you know, coin it catfishing. 
there was a uh, the the lecturer um, maintained that the account was not his and that it was a fake account that had been set up with his photo and that the student was obviously constructing the messages. Unfortunately, both parties were to blame. Uh, the evidence that the student put forward, uh, various, you know, various screenshots of messages that had gone through, uh, wasn't all of the truth. There were 72 missing items over a period of about 24 hours. Now, unfortunately, we were able to substantiate that the electronic account did belong to the lecturer. So he flat out denied it. Probably shouldn't have done that. He probably should have said, yes, it was mine. Um, however, I don't think that that conversation um, was is represented fairly um, and that there was actually a genuine dialogue between the two and she was not a student of mine at the time. So. Uh, however, for the student, she actually had not presented 72 messages. Now, that's a lot of messages in between. Uh, and we saw the she presented the beginning of the conversation and the very end of the conversation. And so the whole middle was stripped out. Now, this you know, interrogation of this information doesn't take long. So it was about two to three days. So to be able to start that complaint and then throw it out, if we have access to that information, we can very quickly uh, establish validity of it. Three core areas that we're using in 2017 <coughs> is conceptual analysis. Because of the sheer volume of information um, that is being shared between people on electronic devices, we can very quickly determine what people are talking about. Um, then we look at who they are talking to with network analysis. And then sentiment analysis, actually determining the levels of expression that they're using as positive or negative, angry or sad, happy, joyous, uh, or analytical as well. So we use concept analysis um, and it, it extracts out uh, lexically important noun phrases. They're the buzz of what a document is talking about. And I think this is best described by actually showing you what we see. Um, and I'm hoping that I can actually press play on this video. Yeah, so it actually gives us a visual representation. This is someone's email. Um, email inbox and we actually see navigating through we are, we're seeing documents that relate to hacking news phone can anyone guess what it's about news corp uh, and uh, then we have information actually regarding the police investigation there flip that to everything that someone has written in their emails over the last six months you can see that we can actually navigate this looking at file music users BitTorrent which is an illegal file sharing protocol. Uh, so in terms of being able to narrow down and see conceptually what people are talking about and discussing, uh, it's very easy for us to navigate that information and throw out all of the spam aside. And the lawyers would spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of their life actually review reviewing. Communication network analysis, so we can use it to quantify volumes of information, determine the origination, time and direction flows, and habitual, pa um, and hab habitual patterns as well. So we automatically remove duplicate copies, those sorts of things, and actually produce it in a visually, a, a diagrammatic representation. Uh, so this is, uh, the person to the right is actually all of the communication flows over the last six months with various individuals. This is incredibly useful with IP theft investigations or insider trading uh, investigations. Probably less applicable, um, but maybe it is applicable when you're establishing the nature of uh, relationship strength uh, or um, who that person is communicating with on a daily <coughs> basis. It's far easier than looking through your phone or in your Outlook, uh, in your Outlook uh, inbox to actually see who has been communicating with whom. This is an entire uh, corporate uh, environment that, we've, uh, that we analyse. Uh, and the purpose of, of this is to show you how quickly we can actually drill down into that data. Um, so this is, has anyone heard the word rat ne rat's nest? Or even seen a rat's nest before, that whole cluster? Uh, it's very complex. Um, you know, our com who we communicate with on a day-to-day -day basis is incredibly complex. Mathematically so as well, uh, because of the exponential factor. In terms of email, you know, you CC in five or six other correspondees and then that blows out and you, you have it to a factor of six. 
um, but very quickly we can drill, that, drill, out, uh, drill down into the data um, and actually see that this, is that 30? The screen's very small. Yeah, 30 emails to a particular person. So we can establish habits from this and patterns and when people started communicating with other people. And that greatly assists, especially when people are investigating. Uh, and often matters that I spend most of my day talking with lawyers, matters are referred through to lawyers. They have no clue about what's going on, who's who, um, and, and the actual the structure of an organisation. This enables us to be able to have tools to very quickly find the, um, out that information and greatly <laughs> reduce the lead time. Uh, so we're showing various um, ways of displaying information as well here. Something I wanted to get onto um, is, uh, and I know that time is short, is sentiment analysis. Actually discussing and looking at emotive anomalies, outliers and trends, contrary wise behaviour when someone says something and does something else, uh, <coughs> separating professional content from personal content. Uh, you look at the example of the professor and the student. You know, if you were looking at that person's electronic communication, is it easy, it's very easy for us to separate out the professional content uh, and work out who that person is actually communicating with in an informal basis. Uh, and that can shed a great amount of light very quickly uh, on how that person communicates or who that person is communicating with. This is an analysis uh, of emotion and text, uh, and you can see that this is actually based off IBM Watson, if anyone's you know, au fait with what IBM are doing with uh, active machine learning technologies. Uh, classifying text in terms of level of conscientiousness and social tone, uh, we can use this, uh, the examples that they actually started with were presidential speeches in the United States. Uh, and actually where the, some of the speeches were framing very negative concepts in a very positive light. Uh, and those speechwriters are amazingly clever. <laughs> Looking at articles and how people have responded to things, we can actually graph the flow uh, of communication as well. Uh, and you'll see there in yellow, there's an expression of joy in that paragraph. So we see happiness content increase. Someone that's on everyone's lips is Donald Trump uh, recently and uh, we've got a little bit of an analysis here of Donald Trump's uh, tweets in terms of their sentiment. Something that this reveals, uh, and you'll see in the bottom left quadrant there's red and blue lines. Uh, the red line actually um, indicates the, uh, I think is it the Android tweets? Yeah, and then the blue line is the staff's iPhone tweets. Uh, and we actually see a, a, a difference uh, in the levels of positivity and, and it's very easy to actually work out the spin uh, that the press team has actually applied to those tweets versus Donald Trump's actual thoughts on situations. Uh, and you know, in establishing trends, we can actually see all of Donald Trump's tweets mapped out and think this can be applied to communications with people your phone communications, those sorts of things, to very quickly work out, and it can be a, a proactive thing, if there is a negative culture in a workplace, are people happy? Those signs that we use in language uh, that can actually um, impact emotional stability and those sorts of things. So there is a, an opportunity to here to use this proactively, but wisely. So our current perspective is a stronger focus on finding information faster. But we still have an obligation to present the facts. Independence is crucial in these matters for us. Even more so is understanding the limitations on all of this analysis. You know, what does the data not tell us? What is it not showing us that is equally important? The absence of data can actually be an indication in itself. Techniques can be used for background information as well, um, but it's very important to apply all of this sensibly. Just because you have access to this information, um, you know, with access comes power and with power comes responsibility as well, um, to act in a, uh, a socially conscious manner as well. Uh, and I see, you know, with some clients, uh, they think they can do it once and then they think the applications are genuinely valid for all. Uh, and that's not the case because everyone communicates differently. So it's only with experience and insight that you're able to, um, to very carefully uh, and present a measured and independent and truthful approach to these things. Uh, and they're not meant to be used as the be all and end all. They are simply tools that are used in the arsenal 
uh, that we have day to day to apply to very specific matters as well. So I don't want anyone to think, oh my God, everything is there. They can get everything. Um, you know, with that, there is an, uh, a need for transparency on both sides. So hopefully I've um, sort of demystified a little bit about what we can recover. Um, and it may make people, you know, consider some of the actions and behaviours. Um, and that comes around to workplace training as well. Uh, and we see a greater trend um, in actually uh, speaking with employees um, from workplace culture, uh, workplace culture perspective about what is acceptable and what is appropriate and giving them the necessary tools and training um, so that we don't have as many investigations and I don't need to spend you know, my weekends sitting in front of computers delving through uh, you know, millions and millions of files. Very good, thank you very much. Well, the catchphrase used to be, it's not brain surgery and it's not rocket science, it's not forensic data technology. That's just amazing. Uh, I thank Patty for gathering a, an amazing group of speakers. It's incredibly stimulating, just like it was last year.